Well, howdy y'all, and welcome to Old Hillbilly Horror Podcast. Growing up in the woods was something different. Let's get this straight, I'm just an average person growing up in the woods. Well, not average, but I am normal to a certain extent. I live out in the wilderness in a large forest reserve in the United States. I've lived with my grandparents with most of my life. I've never really known my parents before this, but nevertheless, to a certain degree, it doesn't matter. I live in the middle of the wilderness up here. Nowadays, my grandparents will be here for a day or two, then leave for a day or two. The length and time they stay and go varies, but in the summertime, I only have a handful of friends that are even remotely able to come hang out with me. I live in a very remote area of the place where I live and all you can see from where I am is mountains and trees. The closest town is around four miles away, and all it really is is a small shopping center with a general store and such, but that's about it. Some gas, some food, nothing special. Oftentimes I get the cabin to myself. It's not exactly an old wooden cabin if you're thinking about it. It's actually very nice. It has four bedrooms and three bathrooms. It's practically a lodge, but all it's missing is a garage. Our cars park in a sort of tent thing. It's just a bunch of wooden poles holding up a sheet metal roof. Because of this, during the winter, We'll often be stuck inside our little cabin for days, weeks, and every once in a while months. I've learned to go hunting, melt ice into water, and basically become self-sufficient from my grandfather. Going to school in this part of the country is kind of like it's optional. For the sake of keeping us secure, I'll use different names for my friends in future stories, so don't try and come find us. The woods are a strange place, it's like they're their own giant, sentient being. My friends Thomas and James would occasionally head down to a nearby creek a few miles from my house. It was a large creek, almost a river, but it was nothing we couldn't handle. Oftentimes during the summer we'd go out for hours without our cell phones and go explore. We all had cell phones, but there's practically no reception out there unless you're directly inside one of the houses, so most of the time they were just useless. Thomas and James were my best friends ever since I could practically think. We all lived within a six-mile radius, a tiny distance considering the size of most of the town. Thomas lived closer to me, so he'd often come over if I was stuck at home. More often than not, we'd sit down in the lounge room and just watch old movies that my grandparents had. Our cabin had a large glass window across the front wall, so you could always see into the distant wilderness. One time, a few years back, Thomas, my friend David and Jasmine were over. It was raining and my grandparents were out for a few days. David and I became close since he moved in that year. I had only recently gotten my license, so it was a dream. It was storming outside, so I just planned to let David and the others stay the night. It was dark out already, maybe around 10 when the four of us were sitting upstairs in the lounge room watching Stand By Me one of mine and Thomas's favorite movies. We were watching it when we heard a large clanging nearby the garage area. Originally, I shrugged it off as wind blowing over the trash cans or raccoons tipping them over until I heard the crash of metal against the building. Despite the rain outside, I knew the wind outside wasn't nearly that powerful to lift the trash can up to smash it into the cabin. I got up and managed to convince Thomas to come with me as I walked towards the outside. Before I went downstairs, I entered my grandparents' room and took the shotgun just in case it was a bear or something. Thomas took the fire poker and walked behind me, scared as a bat when I came to the front door. I looked outside and saw nothing yet. I counted to three before I opened the door to go outside. This wasn't the first time I had to deal with a bear digging through my trash. F bears and shit. Anyway, Thomas and I go outside and scope outside the area. The rain was lighter than I thought it was as the pitch black sky caked the entire yard in darkness. Thomas and I move forward towards the trash can. I know you're not supposed to keep your finger on the trigger, but I'm that moment all I could think about is getting that bear away from me. I hated bears ever since I was young. They scared the shit out of me, but I never felt this fear before. 
I turned the corner with Thomas and found one of the trash cans lying on the ground. I sighed in relief as Thomas looked shocked, looking past the trash. I noticed this so I asked him what was up. What are you looking at? Don't you see it? See what? The big mother F. Thomas pointed forward at a figure behind the tree line. I squinted to see it clearly and made out the figure of a bony, fur-covered being. I looked over at Thomas, telling him it was just a bear and to come on and go. Thomas looked in shock as he pointed forward. Why is it looking at us like that? I glanced back, being met with yellow, glowing eyes from the darkness. I took the shotgun and ran with Thomas back to the house. Before I ran inside, I tripped and shot my gun. It was one of those times where if Thomas wasn't there, I wouldn't be here today. Thomas stopped to pull me up as this weird, distorted roar came from the woods. We didn't have to exchange words to understand it was coming towards us. I left the shotgun and ran inside. Thomas and I slammed the door shut, hell out of breath as we heard the creature walking around. Thomas told me to go upstairs, get the others and barricade ourselves in my bedroom. I nodded and quietly went upstairs, doing just that. Thomas met me there shortly after, holding his spare hunting rifle he always brought with him when he came over. We all spent the night in the same bedroom, guarding each other as we heard the thing walking around the cabin over and over again. I fell asleep sometime during the night and woke up the next morning. Going out to the lounge area felt like it was freezing, every window was open. Nothing was stolen, surprisingly, but there was definitely someone or something inside of here. Thomas and I went outside that morning and found my grandparents' shotgun sitting on the front stoop, the barrel bent to an impossible angle. I had no excuse for that when my grandparents came home. Oftentimes during the school year, after school our school had a small skiing program where around 40 to 50 kids all got together on a bus or two to go skiing after school. Doing this was one of the few fun options we got to do for extracurricular around here. Our high school was small, maybe only 300 kids total. I know small town. We only had one elementary school and one middle high school, where grades 6 through 12 all went to the same school. Often enough, my friends and I would do this during the winter to give us something to do. We took a bus around 30 miles to a nearby campus with a large skiing hill in the area. The town was an entire campus town. Everyone was connected to the college in some way around there. Often James and I along with some of our friends determining the circumstances would all go skiing together. The mountain wasn't all too big, but the trails were certainly long. Each run would take 10 to 15 minutes to reach the bottom. On this particular occasion I was with my friend James. Not a lot of my friends liked skiing, so often enough it was just James and I. It was a few years ago when we decided to go with the bus after school. After a relatively short ride we got off the bus and got our equipment on. We skied for a couple hours with little event. It was just beginning to get dark when James revealed he had a little bit of dope on him. In my high school years we were what you would call the stoners. James would always get weird shipments, usually just weed, but it would get us off our ass. James pulled me aside and told me he wanted to smoke a joint or two and asked me to come with him. Me, being a teenager that wanted to get high as well, agreed to come with. We skied off the path a little ways until we were in a place where we thought we wouldn't be noticed. It was slightly past the ski mountain border so we knew no one would come looking for us. James took out the wrapping paper and rolled us both a joint. We made sure we weren't going to be seen so we took off our skis and sat under a little overhang of leaves and logs that we made the previous winter. We began talking about what teenagers talk about, girls, video games, our home life, all that shit. As it got darker James pulled out some candles and lit them, getting us a little bit of light to wrap more weed. After a while we decided that we'd finish up the last joint and head back since it would be around an hour when the bus left back to the school. James and I began packing up when an odd noise came from the woods. It didn't sound like from an animal or anything but more robotic, like a broken drill on a low battery. James caught on quicker than I did, alerting me to the noise. 
If we were sober, we would have most likely hightailed it out of there as soon as we heard it. But like down high teenagers, I thought it would be a good idea to go find the noise. James agreed to come with me as we had already packed up what we had and set it on the path. James and I both took a candle, walking off towards the noise. The closer we got, the more prominent the noise became, although never growing louder. We walked further into the woods maybe 50 feet when we realized we must have passed it as the noise became more soft. We began searching around for the noise using our candlelight. Back then we never brought our phones on such journeys, we always just brought our watches and wallets to go explore. James walked close towards this evergreen tree as suddenly the snow below it suddenly fell. James fell into a tree well as I heard him yelp in surprise. I ran over and looked down and I shit you not there was just a square hole. It must have been a trap door as I looked closer, seeing the reflective patch on James's jacket. I called out to James to see if he was alright. James replied for me to come down there. I know, straight out of a horror movie, but in our messed up minds we thought, oh cool, a trap door in the woods. I obviously obliged, sliding down into the slot in the floor. It was around the size of a kitchen sink, so it was a tight squeeze in. I dropped down with my candle as the room seemed to light up more. It looked like a bunker as all the shelves and such were entirely devoid of anything. That's when I heard James call me over towards a small steel door along the side. James had a concerned look on his face as I walked over, peering through the window. I was met with only a partially lit room with a single candle sitting inside. It looked like a meat locker room with several rotting animal corpses hanging on meat hooks. I'm so glad the door was shut cause I could only imagine the smell. By then I was sobering up a bit more and realized how messed up this was. I called over to James that we should leave when I hear the familiar buzzing again. I look over and see James rushing back towards the hatch, climbing out as fast as he can. Seeing James react like that is rare. Usually he was the calmest person in the group. So seeing him run, so afraid, I chased after him, scrambling after him. The two of us ran towards our skiing equipment up on the ridge where James was hastily putting on his skis. I asked him what happened that spooked him like that. What James told me shook me up. You know how there was that whirring sound coming from there? Yeah. Well, I saw what was making the noise, it was a camera. Oh shit. That's not it. Then what? It was a motion camera, something was down there with us. That sentence still resonates in my mind. We weren't the only ones down there, and I'm so glad I didn't find out what was down there with us. I know it's not the scariest story out there, but it's something that stuck out to me. Maybe I'll even go back if I can get over the fear of it. It was a couple years ago anyway, and the ski hill has since shut down that section of the mountain due to unsafe hazards. A year ago, it could be a good bonding exercise for James and I to explore since after James got into urban exploring despite the terror he felt there. This next story came from my grandfather when I was just a little boy. My grandpa is usually a very reserved man, but occasionally when he has a few drinks down the hatch, he'll open the hatch a little bit for me to peer inside. This story happened one fall evening when I was little. I'll tell this story from his perspective so it's easier on the writing. I shit you not we weren't expecting to find anything out in there. Even though I know there's weird shit going on around here, I know it's unlikely to run into that stuff. I went out for a hike that day at noon. It was the type of fall where everything was beginning to turn red and yellow, but still warm during the day. God, it was a nice day. I went down the hiking path alone as I did every year. It was maybe a three-hour trail, so I brought everything I needed. Some snacks, a compass, water, my Walkman, and my walking stick. I went down the path with relatively no incident until I was maybe three-fourths of the way down. Most years I'd see the occasional deer or fox or such, but this time was different. It felt as if everything in the woods had cleared out. Not even a bird chirping or crickets just the occasional breeze from the trees. I was down a particularly steep part of the trail, heading down through the trees and winding the path, a little when I looked over and saw this bone pyramid. 
I shit you not, it looked like someone had spent hours making sure it all stuck. On top was most likely a moose skull, but it was odd. All I can remember was the antlers were just weird, bent in an odd shape, and the skull was just built wrong. It was too long and slender to be a normal moose. I saw this and began to move quicker. There was no debris or anything on the thing, so I knew whoever or whatever did this was nearby. I moved quicker, not rushing, but I was unsettled nevertheless. Now before I go any further, let me just say my family is a firm believer in the creatures of the night, like Bigfoot, the Wendigo, Chupacabras. Now that that's out of the way, let me continue. I believe what I found was some sort of ritualistic belonging in the woods. As I continued on, I began hearing this sort of clicking sound like someone clapping two sticks together. The more I walked towards the car, the more prominent it became. I started to get freaked out, and by now I didn't keep my headphones in just in case I was being followed by something. The more I came down the path, the louder the clicking became when I saw the opening of the woods into the parking lot. I rushed over, glad to be near the safety of my car. I rushed out and threw my stuff in the car, never looking back as the clicking remained from the tree line. When I started my car, I looked up and saw this odd-looking silhouette of a man, but its figure was just wrong. It was lumpy, with a large pot of flesh on its arm from what I could see. The more I looked closer, the more fleshy it became. It didn't have eyes, I can remember that. I don't remember how long I stared at it, but it was probably only a few seconds before the shock wore off. I threw my car into drive when I saw its jaw unhinge. It reminded me of an ant eating something, or like a predator mouth from that one movie as it made the same clicking sound I heard earlier. Before I could think my foot hit the gas and I was on my way home. I know it isn't the most dramatic ending, but it was something that made me realize that the woods aren't always a wonderful, safe place, and it's the reason why I never travel alone. I'm happy to share more stories if people are still interested. I know it's a lot to ask for, but I'm happy that by telling people some of these stories people are interested in this topic, I'll tune in later and see if I should tell more stories. If anyone has any questions about these things, I'll be happy to answer your questions. During one summer I got my first job at a nearby Dairy Queen in town. I met a couple of my friends from there, especially this one girl from Amber. Amber was the type of girl that never really grew out of her horse girl phase, but instead adapted to the outdoorsy lifestyle. I was 16 at the time and she was 20. She told me how she came from South Dakota and wanted to live out in the country and discovered our small town and loved it. She went to the college campus nearby, a few towns over in Amber, and I became great friends despite the age difference. During one winter Amber decided to let me stay the night out at her dorm. My grandparents were in Missouri at this time, so it was easy to stay. And before you think what you're usually going to think, she had a boyfriend and I was interested in another girl from my school. I was lying on Amber's bed, watching her play on her Xbox when Amber's roommate, Kaitlin, came into the room. Kaitlin immediately asked if she could take her to McDonald's since by now the buses around town had shut down and since she didn't have a car. After some negotiations, Amber finally agreed, and I hopped down to go join them. We drove down into town at that time, it was around 2 in the morning. I'm not gonna lie, I was on some stuff when we went out, so before we pulled into the parking lot in McDonald's, I got out my eye drops and let them go inside before me. I hung back as the two entered McDonald's. We would have gone into the drive through during this time. The building was undergoing reconstruction, so the drive through area was closed. I finished up the eye drops and got out of the car when suddenly I blinked and I was back in the dorm. I'm looking down, watching Amber playing Halo on her Xbox when I was filled with shock. I tried to chalk it up to me being tired and imagining things when all of a sudden Kaitlyn walked in again. The entire ordeal played out again, Kaitlyn nagging Amber to go to McDonald's which went on for a minute before Amber agreed. Amber then walked up to me and asked if I wanted to come with her. Me, being weirded out of my mind, said no. I don't know what happened, maybe it was a brain F up or something, and this isn't particularly scary, but it's definitely something that has messed with my head. Another story I have is from my cousin that lives in Maine. 
Every once in a while, either my grandparents would go visit my aunt and uncle in Maine with my cousin Mike. Mike was a few years older than I was and grew up also in a remote town up in northern Maine. This story is from when my cousin graduated high school, and for his vacation before starting college, he decided to go on the 100-mile hike with his girlfriend Sam and his friend Aaron with his girlfriend Piper. The four were all outdoorsy people where they all agreed to pack their gear and head out. They packed two weeks' worth of supplies in their backpack, had a friend drive them to the head of the trail and drop them off. The first few days in the woods were relatively uneventful, although having encounters with a fox on their second night. On the fifth day, Piper begins telling the group that she's been hearing footsteps walking around the campsite during the night when everyone was asleep. She assumed it was one of us until we told her in the morning we had all slept through the night. We originally played it off as a raccoon or bear or something when we found a human footprint in the mud. Or at least that's what they thought. A bit uneasy, the four of them quickly packed up and headed off. Another night went by uneventfully. On the seventh night, when they were just getting ready to stop walking and set up camp, Mike saw a weird creature lying on the ground. The body was half decomposed with maggots squirming around it. Its skull and part of its chest was exposed. Its skull was almost like an elephant skull if you've ever seen one. Elephant skulls have a large hole in the center to make it look like a cyclops when all the flesh is eaten away. Mike tried to write it off as a moose with the facial deformity when Aaron noticed that all the legs were missing except one, which had almost like a human foot. Upon further inspection, it looked as though a large human foot had been burned on as a replacement for a hoof or whatever was originally there. The group decides to head a little further during the darkness and to not talk about it for the rest of the trip to not scare them. By now Sam was shaking in fear and wanted to leave right away. Mike and the others set up camp a few miles away on a ridge overlooking a relatively small lake surrounded by wilderness. Sam and Piper were having trouble sleeping so Mike and Aaron took shifts staying up to watch the campsite and keep the campfire lit while they slept, which seemed to ease them. Around what most likely was 3-4 in the morning Aaron was on watch when he hears a twig snap in the woods. Aaron looks up and sees this huge humanoid figure just standing in a nearby clearing, maybe 200 feet away. Aaron woke Mike up to look at the creature, and as soon as Mike wakes up the yellow eyes appear on the creature and darts off back into the woods. Mike and Aaron stayed up until the sun rose, hearing weird grunting sounds coming from the woods every couple of minutes or so. Aaron is convinced that it's Bigfoot while Mike believes it's someone messing with them. But it wouldn't make sense, they're still around 30 miles from the end of the journey, and it wouldn't make sense for someone to just wait out there just to F with someone. The moment the sun rose the group packed up, Mike and Aaron both agreed to not say anything to not scare the girls. The next night was relatively uneventful as they all decided that they would finish the trail by the next day. That morning they wake up to find that the same dead animal carcass they had seen days prior had been laying on the path forward where the end of the trail would be. The group, understandably freaked the F out, decide to jog most of the way back. After walking a while, the group is tired and Piper says she's going to go take a leak further in the woods. The group gets out some food for lunch when Piper comes rushing back. She has a shocked expression on her face. We ask her what's wrong when she explains for us to come see with ourselves. Our stuff is all out, so we decide to leave our stuff behind to go look. Stupid, I know. But they head off just over a small ridge and find this deer carcass literally turned inside out. It literally looked as if someone took a small slit into the deer and used an ungodly force to flip the deer inside out, to have all the organs spill out like a meat slushy. Sam immediately throws up from the smell as the rest of the group look in shock. The group immediately heads back to find in the minute or two they were gone their stuff had been raided through. Mike decided that this was enough and that they were getting out of there tonight. Mike packed up what was left since a lot of their food was gone and got the group to head on forward. The group reached the end of the trail when a forest ranger immediately greeted them. The forest ranger said that the trail was closed for the time being since they had found some hazards. The group went home as Aaron did some research, 
Apparently a dead body was found in a creek a few miles. Let's just say that most of the others aren't that big of long distance camping anymore. Aaron recently tried looking up the original news report though, but was unable to find the article. Sometimes things are covered up because if people knew that shit, I don't think anyone would ever do another journey like that. Growing up in a small town is a strange ordeal. Everyone seems to know each other very well, and the only new people we get are people on long road trips or family coming to visit us. Like I said, I live in a very small town, yet I love it. Towards the west end of town, we have some farms growing. Although most are cattle farms, there are the occasional place where they grow corn, wheat, whatever they can really. There's this old farmhouse that had been abandoned since the 1970s after a supposed murder that happened there. Although it's most likely that the family moved out, and that's what rumors spread. Anyway, when I was little, my cousin Mike and a few of my friends would come over, and we'd hop on our bikes. I remember this was a special occasion since Mike was there. This is the reason we went over there. Mike was the leader of our small gang when he was around and everybody listened no question. We went down the dirt path and Mike stopped the bike. It was around noon when Mike spotted the farmhouse, and I swear to God I can still remember the smug look growing across his face as an idea popped into his head. Mike told us that we were playing hide and seek in the house, since we didn't have much of anything else to do. James and I reluctantly agreed. We were around 8-9 at the time, so we didn't have any judgment against adventure quite at that age. The drew straws and eventually, I was the one that originally had to seek. I sighed and began to count to 90 as I knew they both ran to the farmhouse. 90 seconds passed as I opened my eyes. I smiled as I saw the door wide open to the farmhouse. Those idiots had forgotten to shut it. I thought to myself as I jogged towards the house. I reached the front stoop, heading inside. I remember the boards were so old, I thought every step I took the floor would collapse. I headed inside, seeing the house on the inside. To the right was a staircase while to the left lead to a living room. Straight ahead lead to a hallway to the kitchen then towards the back door. I smirked, knowing Mike and James enough to know they'd hide together in the same place. I looked forward as a creak came from down the hallway. I saw the basement door slowly moving in the wind. I smirked, knowing that they were leaving breadcrumbs for me to find. The basement was dark. I didn't even try searching for a light since I knew it definitely wouldn't have any power. Downstairs I heard a dripping sound. It was like a sink had been left on slightly as the water slowly drained out. I stopped at the bottom of the stairs, holding my breath, listening for any breathing. It was dark, I could barely see five feet in front of me, and the only light down there came from the upstairs. The concrete basement was cold, in fact. The entire basement was entirely cold from what I remember. I began feeling a large anxiety from the basement that I couldn't explain. I listened in and heard a soft breathing noise. By then I knew someone had been hiding down there and I was going to find them. I called out to them, telling them I knew they were there and I was going to find them. I started walking towards the breathing, avoiding anything lying around in the basement. I bumped into a piano and accidentally set off a few keys, which scared the shit out of me. Keep this in mind because this will come up later. I reached the back wall, the breathing having gotten louder. I moved to my right, hearing the breathing louder. The breathing felt warmer as I got closer. I reached out to touch them, calling out to the person when the breathing just suddenly stopped. I didn't hear movement or anything, but I continued moving. I reached the end of the wall, finding nothing. I felt odd when suddenly the piano began playing softly. At first I thought it was just in my head, my mind playing tricks on me. I focused in as the music began playing more violently. By now I knew that this wasn't normal and I began moving back towards the stairs in a panic when the breathing returned, a hot breath on the back of my neck. I screamed as a hand gripped my shoulder, squeezing it softly as I ran. The hand let go as I heard a large crash behind me, like a moose slamming through objects to get to a destination. My legs felt like jello and my eyes began to water as I climbed up the stairs and burst outside. I laid on the ground, sobbing as Mike and James walked over, asking where I had been. 
I was confused. I was downstairs for only around five minutes, but they told me I had been missing for four hours. I was confused when they told me they had been looking for me for three hours, but never checked the basement. When I asked why they told me that the door had been locked from the inside, and when they asked if anyone was in there, all that returned was silence. These are just some stories that are from my childhood and such. These were originally three different posts, but they were deleted. I'll be happy to tell more stories if people are interested. In July 1976, my wife and two children ages 12 and 7, and I moved across the Oregon Cascade mountain range from Corvallis, Oregon to Sisters, Oregon. At the time, Sisters was a small mountain range. I was so naive as to forest management, I didn't know there were designated areas to get firewood. During a Saturday in late October, we were running low on kindling, so we decided to go south as Sisters about 12 miles alongside the road where there was a large growth of two to three inch diameter trees with many blowdowns on the ground. We figured they would be easy to collect and sew up and load into our vehicle trunks. The morning was chilly high 20s, low 30s, so about 8 a.m. we bundled the kids and ourselves and headed out in our two-car caravan. Arriving at our spot, we pulled off the road and got busy. The only tool I had was a small bow saw. While my family gathered the poles, I began sawing. We quickly loaded my wife's trunk, and she took the kids and headed back to town. Once they were gone, I started sawing wood to load in my car. But after a couple of minutes, every hair in my neck, arms, and spine stood up I could. I felt I was in danger and that I should leave. There was no mind speak, just an intense feeling that I was in danger and needed to leave. I also knew something had eyes on me. I immediately stood up as my gaze was drawn to a downed tree about 40 feet away. It had snapped about four feet off the ground and been there a while as weeds and branches were obscuring any sight underneath the tree. I studied that tree briefly looking for something out of place, but I saw nothing and then slowly did a full 180 turn looking for any sign of any indication of an animal in the vicinity. I saw nothing. I later learned I should have looked up into the trees, but it never occurred to me then I tried to forgive myself for an overactive imagination. So I knelt back down and I got back to work. Almost immediately the hair again stood up and those feelings and thoughts came back. So I repeated the slow turn looking for signs something was out of place, nothing again. I studied the down tree to see if I could see anything behind it. There was nothing there. I brushed it off as imagination. I said out loud to myself, if anyone or anything else is there, then all right, I got the message. I'm leaving. It took me two trips to get all the wood and my saw to the car. Once loaded, I went to the driver's side door took one last look around, started the car, and left. I never saw, heard, or smelled anything unusual or out of place. The following Monday, when I went to get the kids from the babysitter, I must have said something to her. Her husband is part of Native American, and at the time was a heavy equipment operator for the Forest Service. Three days later, when I went to collect the kids, Bill was home. I'll call him Bill, it's not his real name. He was known for being a straight shooter. I stopped at the picnic table and said hi, and he said to get some iced tea or coffee and come back to talk to him. When I returned, he immediately asked me to tell him what happened the Saturday before. As I told him, he asked if I knew what it was that bothered me. I told him I didn't know. I figured it must probably it was a cougar, a bobcat, or a bear. He smiled. He asked, did you check the trees above you? I shook my head no. You should have. Then Bill said something about on an apex predator giving a warning before attacking. I thought for a minute and replied, So what do you think it was then? He asked. Could it have been a Bigfoot? I thought he was joking, so I laughed and said something to effect that I believe they could be real, but that they were probably myths or folk tales. For the next hour plus, he related his personal experiences with the people of the forest. Here is one of his stories. Bill was on a job site in Washington State using a D8 cat. He was on the side of the mountain when he stopped for lunch. Where he stopped, there was a 600 to 700 foot cliff drop off on his right. 
He sat on the edge of the cat with his legs dangling over the track to eat and enjoy the scenery of the valley below. As he took a bite of his second sandwich, he heard a faint noise behind him, but on the other side of the cat. He turned to look, and to his surprise his face was about 18 inches away from a huge sabe that was leaning on the track looking at him with a faint smile on its face. He said he knew he was in no danger, and he felt no fear. For some reason that morning he had asked the place he was staying at to pack an extra sandwich for his lunch. He slowly reached into his lunchbox, grabbed the sandwich, unwrapped it, and held it out to his new friend. The sabe took it, ate it in one bite, pushed off the track, gave a slight grunt, and turned and walked up into the woods, giving him one last look. After hearing all his encounters, I left their house that night a firm believer in the forest people. I was on my golf cart by myself, and it was completely dark outside and quiet. I live in a neighborhood surrounded by farmland in rural Michigan, and woods throughout various spots. I was driving but pulled over because this giant beetle was on my shirt. It pinched me and freaked me out. I pulled over next to a stretch of woods and struggled to get it off of me. In the woods nearby I heard walking, like perhaps a deer walking around, so I wasn't scared. Yet the sounds got louder and closer. The walking had gotten so loud it sounded unreal, something out of Jurassic Park like a dinosaur stomping. The walking had gotten overwhelmingly loud and extremely close, so I slammed on the gas and hurry out of there. I looked behind me but couldn't see anything, but felt shivers down my spine because I swear it was inches behind me. Not sure if this has anything to do with it, but I was talking about skinwalkers with my sister and doing some research, so I hope that didn't invite anything. But I can't even describe how loud the stomping was. It sounded unreal and was seriously terrifying. I wasn't too sure what it could have been, but many people are saying it was probably a wendigo, and I do believe this is, they can get up to 15 feet tall, which would explain why the stomping was very loud perhaps. Good evening, fellow enthusiasts. Let me start by validating my credibility first. I've been monitoring the crypt side for a good 15 years now, have a degree in zoology, and a master's focusing specifically on herpetology study of reptiles and amphibians for the newcomer. This academic background has greatly contributed to my pursuit of the known and the unknown. What I'm about to share is a living testament to my adventures in the dark corners of our world. And before I roll the dice on this, know that this is not some drunken tall tale. During the event, I was unadulteratedly sober, senses sharpened by the austere seaside chill. Yesterday, I had a harrowing encounter, the likes of which I've never encountered in my generous stretch of experiences facing the elusive nag's head beach creature. The moon was in complete authority, stars stubbornly shrouded behind the thick shroud of clouds. As the tide surreptitiously slid in, I saw, or rather sensed something, a mere flicker at the corner of my vision, something that required peripheral acknowledgement. A fleeting shadow, a passing chill, an abrupt indent in reality. This being the nag's head beach creature, much like many obscure curiosities we study, appreciates the solitude of night. Nocturnal engagements are its preferred encounters, lingering in the periphery, solidifying its ghostly essence. A mystery etched in the sands of nag's head, always visible from the sides, yet vanishing to thin air the moment direct contact is attempted. Illusory, you might say, but not when you've heard it the sound that threads chills through your spine. The creature in its movements spoke a peculiar language, an alien-like slithering rustle, a chicka chicka, if you will. An uncanny sound clawing up your consciousness, it was akin to the whispers of nighttime wind through desolate dunes, or the uneasy scuttle of a crustacean against washed-up seashells, a serpentine orchestra only the nocturne listens to. Now about its tracking signature footprints you wouldn't expect. They were digital, formed of an enigmatic static that pulsed before disappearing into the soothing waves. Ghostly lit specters on the sand left behind by its passing, as if the beach obliquely hummed with the static discharge of this creature. 
a modern mystery misaligned from anything we perceive as typical. And God forbid, should you strive to photograph this elusive entity, for it would defy the said attempt in an uncannily digital way again, rendering itself only a three-pixel smudge in any photo. An undefined form, yet mysteriously defined by its defiant resistance to be perceived. After the encounter, my mind whirled with theories and speculations this creature's nature, its ethereal presence, and its disembodied essence felt otherworldly. Pondering my experience, the possible explanation that eventually crystallized was dubiously paranormal. I believe that what I encountered was not a creature bound to the three dimensions we live in. It might be our first contact with a creature of the fourth dimension. The digital footprints, the confounding three-pixel apparition, and the ephemeral perceptibility all lead to an elusive creature that exists in a higher order of spatial existence, only partially interfacing with our three-dimensional space-time reality, a being transparent to us, living a parallel life wrapped in the splintering silence of the nag's head night. This is our world, the crypt side. A melting pot of varied realities, countless oddities, and incomprehensible encounters. This was my encounter with the elusive Nag's head beach creature, an experience that tipped my skeptically academic life to a pondering, fear-churning paranoia. But isn't that why we're here? To chase the unknown and expose the veiled truths? Because in the end, isn't that the very soul of cryptozoology? Stay curious, stay brave, and keep your mind open. I was a part of Navy SEAL team for as long as I remember. Still, when it comes to my crazy missions, I have one to share. So the mission had taken us deep into the hostile territory, where danger lurked in every shadow. Our objective was clear. Rescue a kidnapped scientist from an abandoned facility with a grim history. Little did we know, the labyrinthine corridors of this place held not only human threats, but a supernatural presence eager to ensnare us in its dark clutches. As we navigated through the decrepit halls, the air thick with tension, the stench of abandonment clung to every corner. Our footsteps echoed through the desolate facility, a haunting symphony of our uncertainty. The scientist's life depended on our success, but something far more sinister awaited us in the depths. It was in the bowels of this forsaken facility that we encountered the unknown predator. About seven feet tall, its muscular frame and large head with long, wild hair gave it an otherworldly appearance. Yellow eyes, almost glowing in the dark, stared at us with an unsettling curiosity. It stood there, unmoving, as if assessing us. We cautiously continued our mission, keeping a watchful eye on the mysterious creature. It didn't seem aggressive, but an eerie tension hung in the air. Then, without warning, it attacked. The battle erupted in chaos, the creature moving with an uncanny speed and strength. Its sharp teeth flashed in the dim light as it lunged at us, catching us off guard. Our training kicked in, and we fought fiercely for our lives against this supernatural adversary. Bullets pierced the air, and the creature's roars echoed through the labyrinth. It was a battle of survival against both the paranormal and the physical, each member of the team pushing themselves to the limits. In the end, we managed to overcome the creature, but the victory was short-lived. As we called for extraction, our relief turned to dread. Through the facility's shattered windows, we saw an approaching enemy army, their silhouettes dark against the moonlit horizon. There was no time to celebrate our triumph over the thing. A greater threat loomed. Swiftly, we made the decision to retreat, leaving the haunted facility behind. We slipped away into the night, shadows merging with shadows, and the encounter with the unknown predator became a secret etched into the memories of the silent warriors. We never spoke of it again, and the story of that night remained buried in the classified pages of our missions, a chilling chapter in the unsung stories of the Navy SEALs. It had been a year since the strange screams or yells echoed through the new construction development. The memory of that eerie night still lingered in the minds of those who had heard it. John and his wife, Sarah, were the first residents to move into their newly completed home in the peaceful neighborhood. 
The couple had brushed off the chilling encounter as a mere mystery, until one fateful day, a related Bigfoot experience brought the memory rushing back. It was a warm evening and John and Sarah were settling into their new life. The bedroom windows were left open to welcome the gentle breeze. As they were about to drift off to sleep, a series of blood-curdling sounds pierced the silence. The chilling cries started softly, then escalated into gut-wrenching screams before eventually fading away, only to return again. It was an unsettling sequence, Ahur, repeated at the same tones, sometimes punctuated with eerie ahs. Puzzled and concerned, John's initial assumption was that someone was in distress down at the cul-de-sac, a newly paved circle below their house, where a few houses were already under construction. That area had already become a popular make-out spot for high schoolers. He quickly put on his pants and slip-ons, instructing Sarah to call the police while he rushed to investigate. The cul-de-sac was about 200 yards away from their house, and as John drew closer, the source of the bizarre screams became clearer. To his surprise, there were no cars or teenagers around. Instead, the howl seemed to emanate from the dense greenbelt nearby, teeming with brush, blackberry bushes, and tall Douglas firs. The eerie cries persisted for several minutes before suddenly ceasing, leaving John with an eerie sense of unease. When the police arrived, John informed them about the haunting sounds he had heard. With flashlights in hand, they ventured into the Greenbelt to investigate, but nothing was found. The officers reassured John that they would check it out, but found no evidence or explanation for the unsettling experience. Feeling somewhat comforted, John returned to bed, trying to forget about the night's strange events. However, life seemed to have other plans. Over the following months, reports of Bigfoot sightings began to emerge from the Wallowas or Blue Mountains on the eastern Washington-Oregon border. As more stories surfaced, the pieces of the puzzle began to fall into place for John. He couldn't help but wonder if the chilling screams he had heard that night were connected to these mythical creatures. Curiosity got the better of him, and John started to research Bigfoot sightings, finding stories and accounts that closely resembled the sounds he had heard. A year after the incident, he stumbled upon another person's related Bigfoot encounter that had taken place in the same region. This confirmation only intensified his conviction that what he had heard that night was indeed a glimpse into the elusive world of Bigfoot. From that day on, John found himself drawn to the mysteries of the unknown, seeking out more stories, eyewitness accounts, and possible explanations for the bizarre occurrence in his quiet neighborhood. As he delved deeper into the realm of Bigfoot lore, John couldn't help but marvel at the inexplicable wonders that existed beyond the realm of human comprehension. And so, the night of the elusive howls became etched into his memory, forever connecting him to a world of cryptic secrets and unexplained wonders. I grew up in rural Michigan in a small ranch-style house with four brothers and a younger sister. We lived in the country with few neighbors and more woods and farmland around us than people. It was a Saturday morning in early fall. My parents were out jogging a few miles away from our house. This was back in early 20, so no cell phones or way to communicate with them. My older brother was left in charge of all of us, which wasn't out of the ordinary. While my siblings sat inside watching cartoons, I headed outside to shoot my bow from the elevated platform that we shot 3D targets out of. This was my first year being able to hunt for big game with a bow as I was now 12 years old. I was excited for the season to start and shot as much as I could. Where I was shooting my bow was about 25 yards from the house, with several trees around the platform, which concealed my location. I had just shot my first round of three field points into the 3D buck target when I heard a loud slam coming from the house. At first I didn't think anything of it as my sibling are pretty rowdy and assumed they were just roughhousing. The second time I heard the slam I realized the sound was coming from outside the house. This was odd to me because I had told my siblings I was going to be shooting my bow and we have a strict policy of no playing in the yard. If we're shooting my father was very stern in this rule, and it was never broken. Piquing my curiosity, I peered through the tree branches. 
What I saw next made every hair on my body stand on end and sent a shiver of fear through my body. A disheveled man was on the side of our house and was fidgeting with the door handle and attempting to open the door and use his shoulder to get in. He twisted at the door handle and again slammed his shoulder into it. He had on a gray and black plaid coat that was unbuttoned and had a rip in the back. He had blood on his hands which smeared on the white door as he tried again to open it. His pinky and ring finger on his left hand were visibly deformed. His hair to his shoulders was gray, matted down and unkept. He had dried blood on his face. His blue jeans were dirty, torn and wet. He tried the handle again, shoved on the door with his shoulder, and when it didn't budge, he stepped back. He looked around and looked in my direction. My heart pounded. I was frozen with fear, but felt confident he wouldn't see me as I was around ten feet off the ground hidden in the leaves. Multiple thoughts went through my head as I tried to figure out what to do next. He was still trying to work the door handle as I lowered my bow down with the bow rope. Every so carefully and calculated, I climbed silently down the ladder to the ground. Once down I picked up my bow, pulled an aluminum arrow tipped with the 85-grain thunderhead broadhead out of the quiver and again laid eyes on the strange bloodied man. I wanted to run up to the front of the house and try to get inside, but feared he would hear me pounding and come after me. There was no way to contact my family inside, and it appeared this man had an ill intent. Just when I was trying to decide what to do next, my oldest brother peered out the window 20 feet to the left and held up a piece of paper that said 911 and motioned for me to get back up in the shooting platform as this strange man was in between me and the safety of the house. I held my bow up, gesturing to him. Should I use my bow and arrow? He shook his head and motioned for me to get back up in the platform. I took my broad head off put it in the quiver and again hooked it to the bow rope and snuck back up into the elevated perch. After the door hadn't budged, the torn and tattered man turned around and was wandering off back towards the driveway behind our house. I stayed in my position and watched him with the broad head once again knocked on my string. My knees were shaking, my nose was running from the massive release of adrenaline and my heart pounded. Just then I heard a car pull into our driveway. A two sheriff deputies stepped out of the car and came around the back of our house and shouted for the man to get on his knees with his hands behind his head. The two officers apprehended the man and placed him in the back of their squad car. I climbed down and sprinted into the house with my siblings, adrenaline still pumping through my body. Shortly after this my parents had come back and the neighbors came over. Apparently this guy was drunk at 7 a.m. and had driven his vehicle over the guard rail and into the creek by our house. Not wanting to get a DUI, he fled the scene. He wandered to the neighbor's house and had attempted to steal their car out of the garage. And when that failed, he went to the next house and tried to break into their company garage and steal a four-wheeler. When he was caught in the act, he ran into the woods and they had called the police. My brother informed me that the guy had tried to get into our house and knocked on the door and drunkenly fell back on the ground. When he asked to use the phone, we only had a phone with a cord and my brother would not let him use it and asked him to leave. The guy got agitated and then apparently tried the side door. Maybe he thought he was at a different house because he was so drunk, he didn't realize he was at the same house. I'm not sure, but seeing that guy bloodied and trying to break into my house with my siblings inside is still burned into my memory 20 years later. Early November 1984. One Saturday my friend calls me and says, Get over here, I found a ton of grouse. My mom drops me off and we start hunting his neighbor's property with permission. We flushed nearly 20 grouse in an hour, shot one each. Most of these were bumping some of the same birds, I'm sure, but they were everywhere. I did not hunt with my dog that day as mom wouldn't allow her in the car. One week later, my uncle and his friend come out, as they always do, to hunt our property. I convince them to go over to the place from last week. I call, get permission, and off we go. We pile out of the truck with my English setter and my uncle's Brittany. This is old growth woods, mostly oak and other mixed hardwoods, 
mature trees with grapevine tangles all over the place, old dead falls, etc. We are pushing out the north side of a long spur ridge that runs about a three mile in length. The plan is to get to an old gas well out on the point of the ridge and loop around the south side back to the truck. We pushed probably half of the way out the ridge, flushed a couple birds and had a few tough shots. Suddenly there is a rile shot, clearly fired in our direction. We continue forward not really thinking much of it until a second shot, and then the impact of a bullet on a tree between my uncle and I. My uncle yells out and another shot follows, another tree hit, bark flying. We can't see anything. We all yell again. Another shot and a bullet goes whizzing over my head. At that we call in the dogs and back out and up to the top of the ridge. Pretty pissed but realizing a couple 12 gauges loaded with 6 shot are not going to match up to a rifle very well. We get over the ridge and start down the other slope and back toward the truck. There is a rough service road that goes out along the top of the ridge to the wellhead. We were a good 75 yards down the south slope and moving when we hear a vehicle. Off come the orange vests and hats and called back the dogs quickly. Leash them and I for one was all but laying on my girl as she was 90% white. I was behind a huge old oak, but it felt awful small when the black van stopped directly above us. Out comes a guy with a rifle in his hands. He walks over and stands there, looking down the hillside in our direction probably 75 yards away. After what felt like an eternity, he slowly walks to the rear of the van looking our way and then gets in and slowly drives away. We waited a while, then slowly worked our way back to the truck with vests and hats tucked inside our jackets, dogs leashed. We got out of there okay and back to the house. I called the local state game officer as he lived only two miles away and was good friends with our family. He forwarded the information to the state police. They never found the van. That was a very terrifying experience realizing that you could do nothing if confronted. Never saw the shooter until he got out of the van and even at that distance, we were powerless. Since that day I never leave the house with just birdshot. I take five slugs with me anytime I go out with just a shotgun. was hunting behind my house as a teenager. It was a quiet morning, just barely daylight, no wind or anything. I was sitting behind an old fallen oak tree, watching the squirrels play, and all of a sudden the squirrels were gone, just out of nowhere. I knew that usually means that a predator is around. Coyotes were pretty bad that year, so I prepared myself to shoot a couple. Senses up and eyes on the lookout, I see something move way in the distance. So I eased my rifle up getting ready, and that's when I heard it. An extremely high-pitched scream sounded like a woman getting murdered, coming from the area that I saw something move. I didn't know what it was at the time, but I was terrified. I looked out through the trees and saw what it was. About 75 yards away was a big black cat of some sort. It looked huge even from that distance. I took my rifle off safety and sat there watching it. I didn't want to shoot it for I didn't know if it was legal or not. I watched it for what seemed like hours listening to it growl and grumble, trembling the entire time. It finally disappeared deeper into the woods and I noped right on out of there. Told my dad who then called the game wardens, they said it sounded like a black spotted leopard. I'm not 100% sure. That's the only time I've seen it. We heard it screaming one night a couple of years later, but after that nothing. I live in Iowa and during the Persaid meteor shower, I decided to drive out of town to get a good look without the light pollution. I found a nice gravel road and sat down in my lawn chair with a beard to enjoy the show. After about an hour, I hear footsteps walking toward me on the gravel road. There were no houses for several miles from where I was. I could see a form of a very hairy man walking towards me. I yelled to him in a friendly voice to let him know what I was doing and received no answer. Greeted him again, no answer. When he was about 20 yards away, he started to dig and I saw red glowing eyes. I noped right the F out of there. In the brake lights I could see a form, but no detail.
I was staying in a large folly in this case, a fake castle Peckforton in the UK if you want to look it up. Anyways, a bunch of us were supposed to leave the site in the evening and go for a drink in the local pub. I was told the van taking us would be down by the main gate. As off I walked. It's about half mile downhill through the woods. By the time I got to the gatehouse down by the road, it was nearly pitch black and they were long gone. So I waited for a bit just in case and then started the walk back up to the castle. After a couple of minutes I just got the feeling of being watched. I looked behind me and on the path, I thought maybe there was something the size of a cat maybe. I carried on walking freaking out a little bit. I looked back again and now there was maybe five things on the path. Maybe I sped up and then I heard noise there was definitely something following me it was in the woods on both sides of the path. I looked behind again just as the moon came out from the clouds and there were the shapes on the paths in the trees these grey lumps, dozens and dozens of them. I just ran I heard them scuffling and scratching as they ran. But sheer terror gave me a huge amount of speed and I left them in the dark and ran into the castle. Never have I been more pleased to see people. When I was a child, I was out hunting with my father deep in the Appalachian woods. It was getting late afternoon when we ran across what appeared to be an old overgrown logging road of some sort. We followed it up a hill and around a bend to find it blocked by a large fallen tree. We heard a terrible crashing sound from the part of the road. We just came up and saw two very large black cat-like animals racing side by side up the road. I'd never seen anything like it before or since. They were sleek and all black, not making any sounds but their feet. My dad threw me behind the fallen tree and set himself up with his rifle aiming back the way we came. But these animals never appeared. We never saw them again or heard the go off into the woods at all. Could this be crawlers? When I bought an RV camper, me and my friends decided to cruise down the seemingly endless highways of Texas. The sun was beginning to dip below the horizon, casting long shadows over the open road. Inside our newly purchased RV camper, excitement buzzed among our group of friends as we embarked on this cross-country adventure. We had dreams of discovering hidden gems, roadside attractions, and the simple joy of the open road. As night fell, fatigue set in, and we decided it was time to find a place to rest. That's when we stumbled upon the eerie quiet of an abandoned roadside rest stop. The faded sign, barely visible in the moonlight, hinted at a time when this place bustled with life. Tired but eager for a good night's sleep, we parked the RV in a desolate corner of the rest stop. The surroundings were silent, save for the gentle creaking of the RV settling into place. The air was thick with anticipation as we prepared to sleep beneath the vast Texas sky. However, the stillness of the night was shattered by an odd symphony of noises emanating from the nearby woods. Branches rustled, leaves crunched, and an otherworldly howl echoed through the darkness. Dismissing it as the typical sounds of nature, we tried to settle in. As the night progressed, the noises in the woods became more pronounced, more unsettling. Whispers of the wind turned into guttural growls, and shadows danced among the trees. Unease settled over the group, and curiosity got the better of us. With a mix of trepidation and excitement, we decided to investigate the source of the strange occurrences. Venturing into the woods, our flashlight beams cut through the thick darkness. The trees loomed overhead like silent sentinels, their gnarled branches casting eerie shadows on the forest floor. As we delved deeper, an unsettling feeling crawled up our spines, and the air grew heavy with an unspoken dread. Suddenly, in a small clearing, our flashlights caught a glimpse of something massive and hairy. The silhouette of a creature, resembling a colossal, upright ape, stood before us. Its eyes glowed in the darkness, reflecting an unnatural intelligence. A chill ran down our spines as we comprehended the enormity of the situation. When the creature, resembling a massive, hulking Bigfoot, locked eyes with us, a low growl rumbled from deep within its chest. Fear seized us, and without a moment's hesitation, we turned and ran back towards the safety of the RV. 
As we stumbled over tree roots and underbrush, the creature's growls intensified, and the earth seemed to quake beneath its thunderous footsteps. The RV came into view, a beacon of safety in the chaos of the night. With hearts pounding and breathless gasps, we clambered inside, slamming the door shut behind us. The engine roared to life as our driver floored the accelerator, leaving the abandoned rest stop and the menacing creature behind. As we sped away, the woods echoed with the creature's enraged roars, fading into the distance. I can tell you from memory, it was roughly midnight one in the morning. I was right around the area near Lolo Pass. It was my first time working in this particular district, so it made me very nervous knowing about all the recorded sightings and weird experiences everyone had been having before. It's pretty isolated out here, so even if something strange doesn't happen, you're definitely inclined to hear or feel something. So you can't even get cell service there, you feel very secluded. If anything happens to your vehicle or yourself fall out on patrol, this is a place where Bigfoot has been sighted too many times, but to not give it the respect it deserves from a safety standpoint. So anyway, I had already radioed back to dispatch at HQ earlier that evening, saying I was going to be checking up on some pull-offs between mile marker 44 and 42 right along Highway 12. Quite a few people have seen Bigfoot in this area. It's pretty much just bushy and a lot of thicket on both sides of the highway. It also definitely gets very, very dark out here at night. So there I am, driving down the road and minding my own business, and my radio starts to have issues. I heard voices, but they were garbled and breaking up. There was nobody else out on patrol with me though, so I thought maybe other rangers were trying to talk to me. But then I realized they aren't saying anything. It's just static noise coming through that kind of sounded like words. Then all of a sudden, this piercing noise comes out over the normal background, and I blacked out for what felt like seconds, but was probably more like a minute. Somehow I didn't crash the truck. I remember how it felt like that I was stuck in time and could see myself sitting in the car driving, but it's like I was looking at everything through a foggy lens. I quickly snapped back into reality. It felt very disorientating, almost dreamlike, and then when I came to my senses, I realized that all this had happened while my patrol vehicle was still moving up the road. I tried to contact HQ again, but the garbled noise stopped for good after that moment, and my radio went back to normal, so did my headlights. Everything was fine again. There were no signs of any deer on the roads or anything around here where you would normally expect them to be. This area is heavily populated in deer, and they're always out at night, so did not see any. Very strange that made me confused and in turn got paranoid. I just wanted out of here at SAP, so I try not to spend too much time investigating. The next day when I was filling out my reports and dispatch, one of the other rangers who had already worked in that district for a long time told me about this phenomena he called radio fade. He said it happens all the time when you're out there, in what he called ghost territory, which is basically anywhere there's been Bigfoot sightings or activity before. He says the electricity in the air is just different. Your radio starts acting weird and goes black for periods of time. You also feel like you'll black out too. He's had times where he's gone out there, and his blood sugar has randomly spiked. He's fallen unconscious or feels like his nerves and feet and hands are on fire. Strange stuff, really strange. You're alone, and you probably won't notice it, even though it sounds like someone or something is trying to talk to you through the static noise. It's really just interference that mimics voices. If you're with somebody else, though, they might not notice it as much as you because it feels like time goes by differently when this happens, and you aren't sure how long the blackouts will last for. All the sensations are very bizarre, not to mention something I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. Well, the day after this was pretty uneventful, nothing had happened. But I've heard multiple accounts of other rangers too, having very strange experiences out there in that same spot between mile marker 42 and 44. Even other people who do search and rescue when they have to be in that area and radio in, they also have reported strange radio chatter and blacking out. 
The only logical explanation that I could possibly come up with for such a phenomenon would be a magnetic field disruption or some other natural effect. That's the only thing because there's nothing else that's going to interfere with the frequency of our brains and bodies, or just the energy around us other than a magnetic field interruption. I don't know if that's synonymous with Bigfoot activity, but there's definitely something going on. Unfortunately, there's no way to prove something like this one way or the other. It's very odd though, and makes me think twice before I go out on patrol alone after sundown. I'm not sure what really happens to people who get blacked out by whatever that noise was. I think the best way to describe it is like being caught in a time warp or something, but I could be wrong. Overall, I have not had any other experiences like that night out near the mountain. Certainly nothing as terrifying as what happened there the year before I started working. Let me get into that. So I was just finishing up my last week of training in another district when this guy came into our office looking for advice. He and his friends were planning on hiking up a timberline link, which is already known for having Bigfoot activity. But they said their main reason for wanting to go there was somebody had posted weird photos of sticks arranged in strange patterns, inciting that there was Bigfoot evidence. They asked if anything strange like that has happened in the area, and I knew from past reports that rangers always talked about weird things being found up there, so I just told them to be careful if they did decide to go. Although it wasn't until a week later when my training was finally over, I began working at Timberline where I heard what had happened to them. They left the trailhead one night after it got dark. They thought going early would let them beat all the snow and were getting but only made it a mile or two before turning back around because of how difficult it was trying to navigate across fresh snowdrifts, especially that high up the mountainside. The next morning, a ranger out on patrol noticed something strange ahead of him down below, all while he was driving up the access road. When his truck got closer, he saw that there were footprints. It was a giant barefoot, but it didn't look like a bear or anything else native to the area due to how large, deep, and far apart the tracks were spaced. It looked more like somebody wearing boots with about an extra two feet of depth across each step from what you would expect from someone's actual foot size. Plus, there were only three toes on each side, which is very unusual for any living creature or anywhere else. Mind you most have paws and several toes. Anyway, the ranger carefully followed the prince all the way to the near Timberline Lake, where they just stopped out of nowhere as if somebody had just taken flight. The ranger tried to follow the tracks back, but it was impossible because they had already been covered with snow at that point. So he called in help from other civil rangers, trying to get clues on the types of footprints that were there. They walked around Timberline Lake for hours looking everywhere, but could not find anything until they checked down at the water's edge near one of the wooden boat docks, and they were more along the embankment, and they stopped abruptly again. This is where they found very weird stick formations like the same kind you would see in movies like The Blair Witch Project, but on a much larger scale. They just kind of appeared out of nowhere and were very, very creepy. After this, the other rangers and I spent a lot of time walking around this area, but we never found anything else. We could not figure out why somebody would have been wearing boots so big for hiking up the mountain during winter time although they looked more like human tracks or whether they could have possibly come from or gone without leaving any more tracks wherever they disappeared towards. Nothing made sense. It was also weird because there were no other prints leading up to those ones from anywhere near the trailhead, which meant whoever made those had walked all the way up from somewhere down below on flat ground where there should have been plenty of other footprints instead. It's still a big mystery as far as I know, unless it might be one of the other rangers or park service or another law enforcement group who has been trying to mess with us, but that's very unlikely. The other weird thing is whoever was walking around leaving those tracks would have to have been considerable weight considering the indent in the snow. And then of course there was a report from a young woman whose son refused to go into a certain part of the state forest. He was so scared by what he saw in there and she said his story kept changing whenever she asked him what made him afraid in the first place. He claimed he saw something big walking around, staring at him, but it wasn't a person like a man or a bear, but claimed it was walking on two legs, 
did not look like any type of animal he had ever seen before. Sometimes he kept saying that whatever it was had very long arms and legs, but virtually no neck. And his parents even took him to see the local doctor who kind of did an exam on him, but found nothing wrong. Look, I'm not really sure what to make of all this either, but as you've seen, things get pretty crazy out here on the job. And I myself am still very unsure of what to believe and what not to believe. Everything seems so surreal, and to be honest, truth is stranger than fiction. Middle of the night in the Sierra Nevadas, California. Inside a debris hut with my dad. Zone X-12 to be exact. We hiked in about six miles for the beginning of the archery hunt deer. Get woken to a blood-curdling scream around 2 a.m. right outside our hut. We could only make out a partial shadow through the leaves and twigs. Only way I can describe it is a very furry horse, but standing on two legs. The death sounds went on for two, three minutes while we're freaking out trying to knock an arrow. Spent the rest of the night wide awake. That morning we couldn't find a trace, no footprints or tracks in the dirt, nothing. The first thing that came to mind was that it must have been a mountain lion. We've heard mountain lions scream before, but this was nothing like a mountain lion. It was deeper, more visceral. We haven't been back since. What could this be? In 2010, my adventurous spirit led me to the Himalayas in India. Along with a group of fellow trekkers, we set out to explore the beauty of this untamed mountain. As we trekked up to 12,000 feet, the landscape unfolded before us like a mesmerizing tapestry of snow-capped peaks and rugged valleys. Our excitement was palpable as we immersed ourselves in the stunning scenery. On one particular day, as the sun dipped below the horizon, we encountered a peculiar sight. A man, seemingly intoxicated, stumbled upon our path, accompanied by an astonishing number of goats. It was a bizarre sight to witness this man herding such a large flock of goats at such high altitude. We exchanged curious glances, but decided to continue on our way, leaving the drunken herder and his goats behind. Choosing a spot to camp for the night, we settled on an overhang of a cliff, about 500 yards away from the mysterious man and his herd. The thought of a snow leopard in the vicinity lingered in our minds, but we brushed it off as a distant possibility. The night draped around us like a thick cloak, and we huddled in our paper-thin tents. The altitude brought a chill to the air, and we wrapped ourselves in our sleeping bags for warmth. Just as we began to drift into sleep, a bone-chilling scream shattered the serene mountain silence. It was a sound that sent shivers down our spines, unlike anything we had ever heard before. Fear gripped us as we realized the scream was coming from a man, and it was alarmingly close to our campsite. In the darkness, we held our breath, paralyzed with terror. The night seemed to stretch on endlessly as we listened helplessly to the agonizing cries of the man, who was being dragged away by an unseen force. I peeked through a small hole in tent, and I saw a creature that seemed to look like a snow yeti or snow bigfoot. White snowy fur, 12 feet tall, and with red glowing eyes. The encounter was surreal and terrifying, and there was an overwhelming sense of helplessness as we heard a life being taken miles away from any town or civilization. The very notion that we were amidst the habitat of such a mysterious and dangerous creature left us feeling vulnerable and exposed. With each passing second, the harrowing sounds faded into the distance, leaving us to confront the reality of what we had just experienced. When morning finally arrived, the sun brought a sense of relief. There was no trace of the man, nor any sign of the massive flock of goats he had been herding. As we packed up our camp and continued our trek, we were haunted by the chilling events of the previous night. It was a chilly morning as my dad and I set out for our elk hunting expedition in the rugged wilderness of northern New Mexico. The forest was dense and overgrown, with old logging trails winding through the trees. We were in the middle of the day, still hunting with our eyes peeled for any signs of elusive prey. As I walked along the trail, 
I caught a glimpse of something unusual through a small window in the trees and brush. About 100 yards away, there it was a blue day pack, like one of those Jansport backpacks, lying on a fallen tree. The sight was perplexing, as it could only be seen from the exact spot I happened to be standing. I motioned my dad over to confirm what I was seeing. To ensure I wasn't just imagining things, I quickly marked the spot where I saw the pack with two cross sticks and a branch pointing towards it. My dad arrived at my side and squinted through the foliage, verifying the mysterious blue pack's presence. Curiosity got the better of us, and we decided to investigate further. My dad would make his way over to the fallen tree while I stayed put, ready to guide him if needed. He navigated through the thick brush and deadfall, carefully making his way to the location I had marked. As he reached the spot where the day pack should have been, he found nothing. The pack had vanished into thin air. But something weird happened. Behind him, there was a creature. It was over eight foot tall, brown, hairy, and muscular. I'm skeptic when it comes to Sasquatch existence, but this one was real. Perplexed, I gestured towards him and yelled. Behind you. He didn't hurt me. Scared, I ran towards him, but when I arrived it vanished. My dad asked me what happened. Why am I scared? And I wanted to tell him, but of fear that he'd not believe me. I kept silent. So this happened last year, but I didn't have read it at the time, so I figured I'd share it now. I'm confident it was a Bigfoot, but I could be wrong. So I live surrounded by the woods. We only have a few neighbors here and there. Me, my cousin, and my nephew were outside, and then they went in so I was outside alone. I was releasing a snail we found. I released the snail, then heard my dog barking, so I looked up. There it was. By our tree line stood a figure. I don't know exactly how tall it was, but I'd say if not six feet, almost six feet tall. It didn't really have the shape of a human. We have hardly any bears in my area, and if it was possibly a bear, our dogs would be going crazy barking. But with this, they ran from whatever it was. I looked away, looked back, and the figure was gone. I quickly went inside because I was freaked out, also a bit excited because I've always loved cryptids and Bigfoot. So the fact that I possibly saw one made me excited. But that night, my brother and his two friends decided to play hide and seek in the woods. It was at around 1 a.m. I know it's weird to be playing hide and seek that late, especially in the woods, but they did it anyway. Anyways, the next morning they said they swore they saw a figure run past them in the woods. Could it be Bigfoot? I live with my family. But our house is in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by woods. During hot summer nights we sleep with the windows open, just the bug screen between us and the great outdoors. Deer and elk sometimes bed down right outside the bedroom window, because predators will not come that close to the house. We are used to hearing elk snore sighs. They do snore and deer wheezes in the middle of the night. This one dark summer night, though. We were woken up by something that sounded like a gibbering, demented child. It paced around the house, and we could hear the dry grass crunching right outside the window. The thing moved on after a while, but the weird, semi-human noises it made were unsettling to say the least. I saw a thunderbird when I was a kid. So I spent a lot of time stargazing as a kid, one summer. My stepdad bought me a really nice telescope with a camera objective to look at the moon and stars with. One night we went out to the hydroelectric dam 40 miles from the nearest town to get some telescopic pictures of the Milky Way. The moon was out and about half illumination without a cloud in the night sky. We were out there until 1 a.m., and we were packing up the telescope and other gear when something with a simply enormous wingspan sped silently over our heads very quickly. It was pitch black, with yellow wings and cast a shadow on the ground from the moonlight. It was gone in almost an instant. We looked at each other and both exclaimed in harmony, What in the F was that? I have never heard of any kind of aircraft with a wingspan that large or even one that could move in such complete silence. 
Even gliders make some kind of wind noise. We were far enough away from any airport or military base for anything to be flying that low. It was like something not of this world. It creeps me out to this day, some 20 years later. My name is Captain Daniel Harris, and my years of service in Special Forces Unit have led me into countless harrowing situations. Still, nothing could have prepared me for the chilling mission beneath the abandoned Tufelsberg radar station in Berlin. On the surface, our objective seemed straightforward. Locate the hidden Cold War era bunker rumored to contain classified secrets capable of reshaping modern geopolitics. The mission's shroud of secrecy and aura of historical enigma fueled our anticipation. Our elite team, well-versed in urban exploration, moved with calculated precision as we descended into the depths of the decaying radar station. The air was heavy with the acrid scent of dampness and decay, and our footsteps reverberated through the dimly lit corridors. Our headlamps cast eerie, flickering shadows on the graffiti-laden walls, remnants of the station's past. We finally reached a substantial steel door, cleverly concealed behind a faux wall, which led into a sprawling underground complex. It was here, in the heart of this clandestine subterranean world, that we confronted a chilling enigma. As we entered a spacious chamber, we were confronted by a creature that defied all explanation. Standing at an imposing height of nearly eight feet, it possessed the torso of a man, yet its limbs and head were reminiscent of a massive wolf or dog. Its fur was a tangled mass of dark, ashen gray, and its eyes emitted an unsettling, malevolent glow. Before we could react, the creature sprang upon us with astounding speed and ferocity. In the ensuing pandemonium, two of my comrades succumbed to the beast's savage claws, their agonized cries resonating through the underground chamber. The rest of us fought desperately to shield our fallen comrades and repel the assailant. After what seemed like an eternity, the creature withdrew, having seemingly completed its mission to protect the hidden bunker. It darted into the labyrinthine passageways, disappearing into the depths, leaving behind a scene of unspeakable horror and sorrow. We regrouped, our faces reflecting the shock and confusion that the unfathomable encounter had inflicted upon us. Despite our unnerving experience, our orders remained resolute. Find the bunker and unveil its long-guarded secrets. Though haunted by the memory of the dogmen and the comrades we had lost, we proceeded with our mission. Upon reaching the heart of the bunker, we uncovered a trove of classified documents and artifacts from the Cold War era. The treasure trove contained intelligence and technology capable of reshaping the geopolitical landscape. Our mission was an unequivocal success. Reluctantly, we made contact with our general, relaying the inconceivable encounter with this dogman type of thing. His response was fraught with skepticism, urging us to focus on the task at hand and leave the tales of monsters to folklore. Despite the doubts of our superiors, we knew the veracity of our experience beneath Tufelsberg. We resolved to resume our search for the enigmatic creature, driven by a determination to unearth the truth regarding its origins and purpose. Whether the dogman was a product of Cold War experimentation or a more sinister force, our encounter continued to haunt our thoughts as we ventured further into the shadowy depths of the concealed bunker. On Saturday, July 15, 2023, I was at my girlfriend of two years' house. She has a decent backyard, partially open and surrounded by dense woods. Keep in mind Michigan, the state I live in, has some pretty large forests. She has two fire pits in her backyard, one not in the woods, and the other in a small clearing in the woods. I walked to get some more firewood from the clearing in the woods to bring up the second fire pit. As I'm collecting, I look up and see two eyes staring down at me. I stand up straight and this thing is literally eye to eye with me. I'm six foot seven and stands completely still. For the few seconds I look, I can only see a thin body. I haul my butt back to the fire pit and my girlfriend can tell I'm clearly panicked. She asks me what's wrong and I tell her clearly what just occurred. She seems if he doesn't believe in paranormal occurrences, but believes me. 
She convinces me to sit with her by the fire and that it was probably just a large animal. About 25 minutes later, the fire is dying down and suddenly an adult male's scream pierces through the air and it sounds like it came from the forest. We haul butt, leaving the fire smoldering. We stay inside for the rest of the night and nothing else occurs. Her dad hypothesized it was a deer he was out of town at the time. It was in the summer around dusk and I was camping at a remote campground with my dad. There was a lake right next to the grounds and my dad and I would trail Blase through the forest right next to the lake because if you went far enough there was a really pretty waterfall. A few strange things happened on this hike. We found a slash pile that had a little kid shoe on top. When we came to a small clearing, my dad had to take a leak to he faced one side of the clearing and I faced the other and we both clearly heard a child say, I'm over here. My dad thought it was me and when he realized it wasn't, we spent half an hour looking for someone, but we found nobody. After that, we gave up on going to the waterfall and started to make our way back to camp. But there were clear sounds of something following us, twigs snapping, bushes shaking. We haven't been camping there since. When my uncle was in his teens and early 20s, he used to go on a yearly backpacking trip in the mountains of the Pacific Northwest near Mount Baker National Forest with a group of friends. They there were five of them knew each other from high school and over the years as they went their separate ways in life, college, etc. The trip became a way for them to reconnect with one another. Anyway, the first time they made this backpacking trip, they were cresting a peak and came across a wide valley view. They were off trail and making pace cross country, but could navigate well enough given geography. My uncle in particular is a pretty experienced outdoorsman and was even back then. To their surprise, especially given that there weren't any trails nearby for at least a couple miles, the group saw a large house on the side of a small lake. There was a small water plane parked on a dock adjacent the house, but other than this, everything was entirely wild. No trails, no campsites, nothing. The group was shocked, but didn't think much of it the first time. It seemed to be a pretty rad house, so they assumed it belonged to some rich somebody and that it was just a private retreat. It was still pretty cool though, so they decided to return to that mountain crest every time they went on this trip to look at the house. Well, three or four years later, when they came across the house, there was no plane on the dock. They figured this meant that nobody was home. This time, they decided they were going to check out the house. So they made their way down, which took a while through the thick, trail-less forest. What they came to was a remarkably fancy modern-style cabin home. Three floors, huge windows, a massive deck with a state-of-the-art barbecue. Everything one would want in a sick-ass hidden mountain retreat. Cool. While they were poking around, a plane landed. Instead of running and hiding, the group decided to explain the situation. So they did when they met a nice gentleman who had flown in. He was very kind and courteous and pleased to show them his vacation house. From then on each time they went on the trip, they would stop there for a night if the plane was present. Only one year my uncle became curious. What's the deal with this place? So at night, while they were sleeping in the house, he crept around and investigated a few of the many rooms it had. In the basement, he found what explains everything. Massive piles of weed and brick form stacked row upon row next to stacks of cash. Instead of freaking out, he went back to sleep and didn't tell his friends until they had left the next day. Not exactly spooky, but I feel like it fits in with the vibe of this threat. A few years back, my fiance and I went up to stay at her parents' property in Northern California for a weekend to camp, hike, do some astrophotography, and generally just enjoy nature. This place is a good 20 minutes from any real town and far enough from any big city that you can faintly see the glow of the Milky Way at night. The property is pretty huge and has a cabin, but we both prefer sleeping out under the stars, so we set an air mattress in the bed of my truck 
and pulled it up next to the pond. We got there a little after three in the afternoon, and after getting everything set up, we decided to go for a walk. This being just a quick walk, I left my phone, wallet, keys, etc., and my backpack to avoid any distractions, even for just a little bit. When we got back about a half hour later, I noticed that my backpack was zipped open and laying on its side. I was sure that I left it zipped up and standing up. I was concerned and brought it up to my fiancé, but she convinced me that I probably just remembered wrong, as I sometimes do. The night goes on and some clouds roll in, ruining our chance to stargaze, so we decided to get to bed a little sooner than normal to get an earlier start the next morning. After some wilderness sexy times we hit the hay. Sometimes I have trouble sleeping at night, so while she sleeps I'm often left laying there for an hour or so until I'm actually out. It's never bothered me too much, but this night in particular I remember wishing I could have just fallen asleep. A little while after we both went to bed, I heard something splashing in the pond next to us. I didn't think much of it, probably just a small animal, maybe a deer. Worst case scenario, maybe it was a mountain lion, but I've heard they don't bother campers all that often anyways, so I wasn't worried. It wasn't until I heard the word, hey, from somewhere across the pond that I was legitimately freaked out. My heart was beating out of my chest. I turned my head to see that my fiancé was still fast asleep, which was good, because I don't even want to imagine how she would have reacted. I laid in silence for what felt like hours, but probably just about five seconds later I heard the word, hey again. This time it was a little closer than before and I knew it wasn't just the wind or my ears playing tricks on me. One afternoon in Temp, Arizona, a man walked into a hotel where I worked. He had a coat on a pea green military type coat and butcher paper, yes, he had butcher paper around himself like some kind of tube top, under his coat like a shirt. In addition, one of his legs was twice as big as the other. He asked to use the payphone in the lobby. I told him, sure not yet realizing how weird he looked he was obscured by the desk and the entry door. We started out with a weird vibe the moment he crossed the lobby to the phone. When we finally got a chance to look at him, he walked a bit slow. However, this made sense as his leg appeared swollen. He then made a call and turned slightly to keep me and my co-worker in his attention, sort of out of his peripheral vision. Very soon we could tell he wasn't listening to anyone, and the phone made noises like it was off the hook. I decided that was enough and demanded he leave, which he did abruptly by our side door. Now the really weird part. My coworker took a picture of him on that payphone with an old flip phone. In the digital pixelation he was moving, which rendered him blurrier than the rest of the picture. He looked like his face was an oversized toothy grinning skull black eyes and a hole where his nose should be. It was so bizarre. It reminds me of the story about the man made of parts and the mirrored sunglasses, a story from Victoria, England, in which a man encountered a man he thought was made of parts. Later that day, a police officer came to the hotel asking if we had seen a man fitting the same description. I acknowledged that we had and told the police officer what occurred. I then inquired why he was asking about this bizarre man. The police officer stated that the man was seen in a nearby park by a couple who later reported that the man had suddenly vanished into thin air just a few yards away from them. This occurred in late 2019 before the sea lockdown. I haven't heard anything further about the unknown man or whatever he was. So I need some advice I live in the backwoods of NEPA and yesterday, while hiking into state game lands, I heard my nephew screaming for help. Mind you, I am three miles from any roads and they were miles away shopping. My dog was terrified, I was wary and ignored the yelling and just pretended it didn't happen. It went off and on for an hour or so and then silence. I continued my way back home through the woods when I was done. Last night, after a bunch of storms roll through, I hear my dog's collar tags tingling outside. Like he's running, walking, all sorts of tingles. He was next to me, 
his collar off for the night. He then proceeded to go hide upstairs next to my dad for the night. He's never done that before. Am I experiencing a skinwalker? I feel like I led something home yesterday. Hello everyone. I'm not really sure if I should post this, mostly because I'm not really sure if what I'm experiencing is paranormal in any way, but... Yeah, I just need some kind of confirmation whether I'm just imagining things or not. Now, I also have to say that this post is going to be pretty long. These things have been happening for about a year so, there's a lot to tell. I also have to state some things before I start telling you my story. I'm still in high school final year so I still live with my parents in a relatively small apartment two bedrooms, a kitchen, a bathroom and a hall. The apartment building was built somewhere in the early 1990s and my apartment was firstly inhabited by a small family before my parents moved in 2001. I don't have any mental illness and no record of any in my family, so what I've been seeing or hearing is most probably real. Now let's go through my story. When I was young, I was extremely afraid of sleeping alone. Now this is normal for any child, but my fear only disappeared when I was about 11 or 12. Now that I think about it, it might have been because of the sounds that I could hear at night. The building is relatively new, so there are no creaks or other sounds, even though the water can sometimes be heard circulating through the pipes. But ever since I was little, I could hear footsteps in the hall at night. Whenever I went to check, there was no apparent source. This startled me a bit in my early years, but as I grew older, I assumed they were from the neighbors above and kind of shook it off whenever I heard them. About a year ago, though, things really started to happen. And it all began with me having a sleep paralysis experience. That night, I woke up, but I couldn't move or speak, only look around my dark room, illuminated eerily by moonlight. At the foot of my bed stood a tall, dark figure. Not abnormally tall, somewhere close to my father's height at that time. I couldn't make out many details a part of it being humanoid, but it didn't speak or even move as a matter of fact. It just stared at me. I remember the feeling of just laying there, watching that figure stare back at me, but weirdly enough, I was completely calm. I wasn't confused, scared, horrified even, just calm. A month after that, I was on my PC, with the door to my bedroom closed. My desk with my computer is stationed on the other side of the door, so my webcam looks directly to it. That evening, I was on Discord with my friends and I had my camera turned on. We were just talking, chilling, laughing. Normal things. As I had my headphones on, I couldn't hear anything apart my friends' voices. Now, I only found this out about a couple of days later. But sometime during our call, my friends saw my door open by itself, but they thought it was my mother checking in on me. I didn't tell them that, but I knew for a fact that I was home alone at the moment. This really freaked me out and for a few days I was terrified of being alone in the house. I thought someone broke in during that time, but there was nothing missing and the front door remained locked from the inside. The next few months were quiet, very quiet. Nothing happened and the footsteps in the hall were gone. My theory about them was enhanced by the fact that the neighbors upstairs moved out and to this day, no one lives in the apartment above. But then things started going down. I started finding some of my things slightly moved. A pen from my desk was on the floor. A book in my bookshelf was now on my bed and things like that. I talked to my parents about those, but they said they didn't move anything. Then I would find a door to a cabinet or wardrobe randomly opened and left that way. Most of them also had nothing to do with my parents. This is when we started to jokingly say there was a ghost in the apartment, and we named it Mark. I know it sounds stupid, but we chose to amuse ourselves instead of worrying. Something any person would find much more comforting, I believe. Then we installed the light. As we sleep with the doors to our bedrooms open, it is inconvenient when someone turns on the hall light at night, when they go to the bathroom, mostly because the other are them woken up by it. So to avoid stumbling into things while navigating through darkness, we installed a motion-detecting hall light. Simple, right? Kinda. 
except of the fact that ever since we insulted it, I barely sleep at night. The footsteps now returned, even though there is absolutely no one above us and we live at the ground floor. But now, whenever I could hear footsteps, the light in the hall would turn on, as like detecting movement. But no one is there. I never managed to record it, so when I told my friends about it, they laughed at me. But when I had one of them stay overnight, their opinion changed within minutes. A week ago, I took a shower at about 2, 3 a.m. Now, I might just be paranoid, but I can bet there's something there with me whenever I enter the bathroom. Watching. When I got out of the shower, I noticed scratch marks on my left arm. Two parallel lines and a perfect M or W. Now, as I said, most of this could be explained like sleep paralysis hallucinations, footsteps creaks of the building, light faulty wiring, but for the sake of me, I can't explain the scratches. The moved items, the open doors, or even the presence I sometimes feel watches over me. me. My friends suggested I contact the spirit, but this is where I stop. I know for a fact how dangerous Ouija boards and seances can be, and I am not willing to invite something else into my home. And I also live in a country where religion isn't taken that seriously apart from the elders. Most priests don't even believe in God and our religion doesn't really cover ghosts or spirits. So there is no way to exercise or bless the house or something like that. So I ask you, a gathering of the most enthusiastic paranormal enjoyers and investigators. Is this paranormal? And what should I do about it? So I used to live in this small one-story house with a, at the time, pseudo-large family. Three kids, me included, and my mom. So the house had this added on living room. It was a recent addition to the house that I guess the original owner decades ago didn't want, but was added after he passed. Now I am not superstitious or anything, but that whole room felt off, like it was uneven and slanted even though it wasn't. It gave me the chills to be alone there. One night I leave my room for some reason, probably because I was scared or something and I slept on the couch in the living room because it is an eyeshot of my mother's room and very close to it. We also had this mirror. It was a large vanity mirror on rusty hinges that would move when hit by wind or a very strong current since it was made of copper and rather large. So I'm sleeping in the living room or trying to, and then the mirror starts to move. Now it is stagnant in there, like no air current. The heaters aren't blowing. Nothing. And this big-ass copper mirror rotates and faces me while I am on the couch. It turned real slow, too. It squeaked and everything and bothered the hell out of me. It lasted an eternity. Couldn't sleep all night and laid awake facing away from it. The following morning when I got up and walked over to my mom's room to wake her up, the mirror was silently turned back to its original position. I don't believe it was anything supernatural, but it freaks me the F out to this day and I'm glad I never have to set foot in that room again. Every person that has ever been close to me has seen or had a conversation with me when I wasn't around at least once. This started happening around the time I turned 13. I had an early day at school and decided to hang out at a friend's house instead of catching the bus home, stayed for a few hours and walked home. When I got into the house, I heard my mom speaking to someone upstairs, which was unusual since we were normally the only two people there at any given time. When I turned the corner to see what was going on, I saw her looking into the open door of my room and heard her having a conversation. Obviously confused, I asked who was over, at which point she jumped, turned around, and got white in the face. At the time, she told me she was on the phone, but later confessed that she thought I had been home since school got out and was trying to wake me up from a nap. A few years later, I got into my first serious relationship. After a few months of dating each other, I had moved into my first apartment with a few close friends. One night while she was staying over, I was awoken and saw that she was crying. When I asked her what was wrong, she told me that she had gotten up to use the bathroom. When she came out, she saw me walking down the hallway and towards the stairs, assuming I had just woken up from her getting out of bed and went to get a glass of water. She didn't think anything of it. 
until she turned the corner and saw me laying in the same spot I was in completely asleep. Not long after that, my roommates also started having similar experiences, usually at night. This has since continued throughout every relationship and close friendship I've acquired, to the point where it's become something that I have to disclose while also trying to sound sane. The most troubling and confusing part about this is that I've never personally experienced it, and the only time I'm aware that it's happened is when I'm comforting someone from whatever they saw. This happened in the middle of nowhere, Missouri at our house, and it has two parts. I'm not sure the two parts are related, but I've always thought that they were. First part is that I'm 16 and I get home from school, and there are two guys sitting on my porch. Keep in mind, I'm in the middle of nowhere, so they see me, and I see them, and it's not like I can turn around. So being 16, I get out and go talk to them. Turns out they are basically bums or hobos that live on the rails. Funny thing is that they are at least 10 miles from the rails, and I have no idea how they picked out my house from the dozens they passed. Anyway, I start talking to them, and one is a larger guy with a beard that is doing all the talking and giving me the full-on, oh, I'm down on my luck story. The skinny guy was not saying a word and kind of on reflection acting drugged up. They want me to give them a ride to the YMCA, which is about 25 miles away. Being 16, I think. Why not, about that time my mother comes home and freaks out. Calls the sheriff and he comes and picks them up. Doesn't arrest them, just has them transported to a shelter. I talk to the sheriff later, and he says that he ended up taking them to the YMCA for the night. No big deal. Then it gets a little weird, and this is when I've always wondered the connection. My mother goes out of town to stay with her sister for the weekend. Not a huge deal, I was 16 at the time and it happened every few months. About 1am I start hearing a noise downstairs, not loud enough to wake me up and make me say, holy shit, someone is breaking in, but loud enough to wake me. This goes on for about 20 minutes or so and I'm finally awake. I turn on all the lights but don't go outside, at this point I'm about half freaking out. The noises aren't loud enough that I think something is wrong but they were loud enough to make me go. WTF. Nothing happens about 45 minutes later I go to bed, but have opened the blinds and looked outside. I'm laying in bed again thinking to myself, well, I didn't see anything it sure was dark out there and I realize. Hey man, you have a giant ass overhead street light on an electric pole outside that is always on. Why is it dark? This prompts me to freak the hell out. I get up and of course load up a shotgun, grab a few cans of Dr. Pepper and stay up all night while staring into the darkness because sure as shit my giant street lamp that has been on every day for 16 years is dead. Morning rolls around and there is that dew that covers the ground. I go outside and first look at the light and the fuse was pulled laying on the ground. It was one of those old fuses that looked like a shotgun shell. I put it back in and it worked the next night. I walk up to the house and in the morning dew there are all these handprints on the door, as well as all these pentagrams drawn on the door. What freaked me out was that there was all this paint gone and chips around the screen or glass door, like someone had a small screwdriver and was trying to get in. Scared the crap out of me, and the police decided that it was just someone screwing with me or it was random. I've always thought that the two hobos came back. But keep in mind if they did, they would have had to make it 25 miles. So at that point I have no idea what they were planning. Also my mother thought I was making the whole thing up. She thought I was doing a practical joke and couldn't figure out the punchline. She stayed at the sister's house. I was running along a trail in the woods behind a park and decided to go farther than I had in the past. So I was running along, and there was this old, beaten stuffed animal sitting alongside the path. Kind of weird, but I kept going. A little farther along the path, there was a weathered doll sitting on a stump. They weren't super visible, but enough to catch your eye as you went past. I kept running, and then turned a corner to see a couple dozen stuffed animals and dolls stabbed to and hanging from the trees. Safe to say I promptly turned around.
In high school, we moved into the middle of nowhere. Our house was surrounded by hills and woods. I loved going on walks with my dog. There was one incident that freaked me out really bad. It was just me and my dog. We're a good hour away from the house or anyone else. My dog usually led the way, always knew the best paths. Out of nowhere, she turns to the right and goes completely tense. Her back fur ruffled and she started growling. A minute later, I could hear them. A whole pack of coyotes. I couldn't see them, but it sounded like they were very close. Next thing I know, my girl takes off through the woods. I yelled at her to come back, but the next thing I know, she's gone and I hear this awful dog fight and then silence. I didn't know what to do and right when I started to panic, my girl comes tail wagging, not a scratch on her. She loved on me and then led me home. Best dog I've ever had. She passed away this year. Don't think I'll be able to walk the woods without her. Grew up in rural western Pennsylvania, outside of Pittsburgh. Lots of strange things in the woods out there. From abandoned sulfur mines to hermit shacks. The strangest thing we ever came across was a little house in the middle of nowhere. No road, no driveway, but it wasn't a shack, it was a house. Like a suburban house. It always freaked us out and we left it alone. Never saw anyone there and looked abandoned, but not yet run down. So, fast forward a couple years. We are older and bored. One day we decide we are going in. There is no boogeyman here. But it still freaks me out to this day. We go in through the kitchen and it was normal. In the living room was a beautiful old player piano. Like a big one. Then we realize the room has nothing in it but the piano and boxes. Lots of boxes. In the boxes are the rolls for the player piano. The rolls are the paper inserts that the piano reads to play the song so the living room is stacked with these things. Like floor to ceiling. So we go upstairs and it's the same thing. Piano rolls everywhere. Stacked on the bed, under it, in the closets, from floor to ceiling in places. I remember starting to get really freaked out. I still do. The vibe was all wrong. There was a point when we went back into the kitchen and my buddy opened some cabinets. All piano rolls. We sprinted away from that place like it was on fire. Always stayed away from that part of the woods. My roommate and I are house hunting. We went to one that just kept calling to us. Every time we opened our app's boom, it was right there in our faces. We both felt like something was a little bit off about it, but finally we caved and said sure we LL go tour it. We get to the house, walk around it, everything seems fine. Garage is boring, paint's peeling, boards outside are rotting, etc. So that was a turn off for us. We started to go back toward the front of the house, and I noticed the back door was wide open. I thought that was odd, as literally anyone could just walk in and squat. I got a funny feeling like I was being watched as we walked past it going back to the front of the house. Well, we went inside anyway, just to see it since we were there and our realtor put in the effort to get us a showing. Everything was fine, it was a cute little place, but that's just it. It was little. There was basically no living room. But enough about that. I'll get into the actual experience now. We walk through the place, and we get to the basement stairs. There's no door to them. Just in the back behind the kitchen, there's a small hallway that has the door to the backyard, and at the other end an open doorway, and then the stairs down. Instantly, I felt my hair stand up on the back of my neck, and I felt scared to even look down the stairs. My roommate looks at me and said, I feel it too. Maybe I had a look on my face or something I don't know. We go down the stairs and I said out loud, F sake, please don't touch me, I'm just here to look. Our realtor looked a bit uncomfortable too. We get to the bottom of the stairs and the oppressive feeling backs off, leaving in its place the feeling of still being watched, but by something that feels scared, almost like a scared child. We look in the bathroom, the two bedrooms, and once I got to the closet in the second room, the I'm scared feeling got stronger. Not like me being scared, but whatever was down there with us. I walked out of the room, 
and straight across the living room down there. There was a very small area about the size of a small closet with half of an original concrete wall. I instantly felt an overwhelming dread and almost burst into tears. Then I felt the oppressive one come back full force. While it wasn't audible, it felt like it was screaming at me to get the hell out of its space. I ran out of the basement so fast. Once back upstairs, it was almost normal feeling. We went up to the loft in the attic, and it actually felt quite comfortable. Until we turned to go back down the stairs to the main floor. The lights were all off when we went up, so my roommate flipped the switch to turn them back off. They flickered, then all went off except the one above him. He flipped them back on, but nothing changed. Flipped the switch back down, no change. That one light stayed on. We went back to the main floor living room, the realtor asking what we thought. My roommate kept looking toward the basement. We finally went back outside and decided we weren't taking this house. Roommate and I got in the car and I asked him if he was okay. He said it followed us everywhere after the basement. Oh, and apparently I said, don't worry, I'll find it, when I walked out of the closet and to the concrete wall. Now I've been having a nightmare nearly every night since we were at that house. I'm trapped in that corner. I'm screaming nonstop. It's dark and I'm in so much pain. I think something terrible happened there. But why am I dreaming as if it's me experiencing it? My husband listens to your podcast regularly, and until a couple days ago, I thought he was nuts. While my encounter was not as up close and personal, it was nonetheless terrifying to me and I feel that it has forever changed me and the way I view the world. I had just arrived home a few minutes after dusk after visiting my parents. Our location is rural, but we do have a few neighbors within shouting distance of us. We have 33 acres of mixed forests and fields with lots of thick brush consisting mostly of briars. I had my two young children with me in the Jeep ages two years and 11 months when I pulled in the driveway that night. My husband was working late with an emergency case. It was near fully dark when I arrived home. As soon as I stepped from my vehicle, I felt creeped out. It felt different outside. We have lots of peepers and crickets that would normally be making lots of noise. Even the birds are usually chirping until an hour or more past dark. This time, there was not a sound. It was very warm that evening, so the peepers should have been in full chorus. Because of my uneasy feeling, I was rushing to get the kids in the house at the same time and did not want to leave RJ in the car alone for a minute, as I routinely do. He and our older daughter, who was asleep, are normally too heavy for me to carry together at the same time. That night, though, I grabbed them both, one in each arm, after finding my keys to the front door and carried them both. Usually, I would use the auto garage door, however, the opener did not work. When I reached the front door at the top of the stairs and got situated on the front porch, I put down Angelina in order to open the front door. As soon as I turned my attention back to the front door, it happened. Somewhere to my left came a sound that will be forever seared into my memory. It started low and slowly increased to a moderately loud growl. It was deep toned and very guttural and was angry or hateful in character. It was nothing like anything I had ever heard before, but it did sound canine in origin, especially after spending an hour listening to various animal growls. The growl continued for approximately 10 seconds. I was so terrified I was fumbling with the keys. It really felt like I was dropped into an 80s horror film. I really did think I was going to die. I was sure any second the thing making this sound was going to pounce upon me and the kids and eat us right on the spot. The growl sounded as though the creature was standing just off to my left. I refused to look out of fear of what I would see. It sounded so close and at or even above eye level with me. My porch extends another five feet to the left and then off the porch is the front of the house. There's 35 yards of grass to the edge of the tree line and there's a field with two foot tall grass opposite that. There's also a small shed between our porch and the tree line. 
Standing on the front porch from my head to the ground is approximately nine feet. So I assume it was standing near the corner of the house. I had never been so afraid until a few moments later when it actually spoke to me. As the growl continued, it seemed to melt into audible words, spoken in a very deep and gruff tone that seemed to have a rough sort of reverberation quality to them. What I heard as clear as day was, you can't get in. The only word that I'm unsure of is the first, you. As the sound of growl transitioned to English words, and it sounded more like a now I was hysterical and dropping the keys. Finally, I got the right one in and got the door open and got in. I had to kick my daughter through the door regretfully. Strangely, she seemed oblivious to what had just transpired, as if she didn't hear it. I slammed the door shut and never looked. I didn't hear anything else that night. I called my husband and his friend to let them know what happened. So I never did actually see what terrorized me because I couldn't look. I've had two days to, to think about this encounter and talk with my husband, who has listened to every episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm fairly certain that this was what was growling at me. The sound was not human and seemed like it was amped or mic'd up, because it seemed so powerful. Not that it was a loud growl, but it seemed unnatural. Also, the height it seemed to emanate from and the silence that preceded it lead me to that conclusion. My husband agrees because the entire week, he too has been on edge. We have lived here for a year and all seemed normal until this week. Our cat, which is an indoor cat, got out accidentally and has vanished without a trace. She has gotten out before and just stood around until we got her back in the house. Also, my husband said Tuesday night he experienced the silence outside and it really unnerved him too. He says he has never experienced anything so eerie. On Wednesday, he took our dog up into the woods to look for our cat and felt very uneasy. He said the dog kept tucking its tail and turning around, wanting to go home. It's not like our dog or my husband to feel uneasy in the woods, because both of them love the outdoors and are very comfortable in nature. On Thursday at dusk, he took the dog around the back lot and says something took off from the thickets at a sprint and came crashing through the woods down the hill towards him. He always carries a sidearm when he is out and is normally not afraid of anything, but he actually turned and ran back up towards the house. Whatever was charging stopped seconds after he stopped to listen and did not make another sound. He was very concerned when he came in, stating that he knows what big game sounds like and that this was just not right. Even he was surprised that he ran from the sound. The following day was when my encounter happened. After talking about all of these events with my husband, we are concerned that there is a dogman in the area. My husband listened to episodes 90 and 91 and is so worried that this thing has decided to stalk one or both of our kids. My husband said that based on those episodes, it sounds like the dogman plans ahead when snatching kids and he thinks it may have been scouting the area with plans to do just that. He said it was doing that or that it was waiting for me to leave one of the kids in the Jeep for a minute. Either way, none of this is good. The main reason why I wanted to submit this was because it seems very unique in that it spoke to me. It wasn't the words, but the feeling it gave me that disturbed me most. It was as if it was trying to give me the impression that I was nothing and that I was weak and just food. I got the impression that it was saying, can't get in, like, haha, you're mine. It's hard to explain because it seemed like it was conveying its frame of mind and that it was, for lack of a better description, making fun of me in a very cruel way. I really want to know if you have ever heard of one of these monsters actually speaking. My husband and I really want to believe that our conclusions are wrong, but instinct and your show have us highly convinced that it in fact was a dogman. We thank you deeply for keeping the show going, being informed, and not leading us to believe that the monster is probably literally hiding out and waiting for us. That just might save one or all of our lives. Thank you for all that you do. Please let us know what you think about all of this. At the time that this incident occurred, I was homeless and got around on an old bicycle. 
One evening, I was looking for a spot to set up a quick campsite in a small patch of woods along a public bicycle path in West Central Dark County, Ohio. I was cold and eager to get a small fire started and get into my sleeping bag. The area is a refuge for stray cats. Many locals drop off their unwanted or stray cats in this area, and some local kind-hearted folks feed them and provide plastic containers for shelter. When I found what I thought would be a suitable spot to set up camp, I set my bag down and walked a few steps to a large tree to empty my bladder. I had a small flashlight in my bag, but the night sky provided enough light after my eyes were adjusted. Suddenly a cat dashed through the brush very near me and startling me, then another further to left. As I looked toward the sound of the last cat running, I could make out the shape of the plastic containers in a small circle. These containers house some cats. I then noticed three sets of pinkish-orange glowing objects with slight movement. I first assumed the glowing objects were the reflection of three cats' eyes. After watching the objects further approximately 30 seconds, I saw that the glowing was in fact some sort of eyewear worn by three human-like figures. As I knelt down to watch, I could see these figures were handling the cats, and the subjects were wearing very low reflective off-white or gray coveralls. After about two minutes, all three subjects turned their heads toward me. Thinking they might be animal control workers and not wanting to frighten them, I stood up and asked, How are you doing? With no vocal response, all three began moving towards me, instantly closing the 30 feet that separated us. Slowly again, I asked, what are you guys doing out here? They continued moving towards me. I heard them talking or communicating, but inside my head and in a strange whisper. I couldn't understand. I also noticed they were shorter than me. I'm five foot 10 and guess they were 10 to 12 foot shorter than me. I turned, got on my bicycle and pedaled out of there. After several minutes of fast riding, I noticed no vehicles or signs of activity. It was almost like I entered a time war. I didn't notice anyone or anything following me. I eventually found my way out of the area, but I was disoriented for many hours. I didn't sleep that night and continued riding west until I couldn't continue. I finally stopped and slept a few hours in a small park. I have no idea who those figures in the coveralls were, but I don't believe that they were human. The usually peaceful Amish neighborhood had been transformed into a hotbed of tense excitement and fear, all centered around a little white church standing serenely on the prairie. The Amish farmers and their families, known for their sedate and staid ways, were now gripped by curiosity and anxiety. The cause of their disquiet was a real live ghost that had taken a liking to haunting the immediate vicinity of the church. Rumors of the playful and ethereal apparition spread like wildfire among the villagers. Stout-hearted men, unafraid of fear, claimed to have seen it describing a four-foot-tall figure with broad and squat proportions, long arms, and unnaturally large black eyes. The ghost's first appearance had been witnessed by a young man from Clarion, who encountered it one night after returning home from spending time with his sweetheart. He shared his eerie experience with the villagers, but despite many keeping a watchful eye, the ghost remained elusive. Determined to debunk the stories and prove their bravery, four young men armed themselves with courage and muscle and set out to investigate the haunted church. As they circled the building and its surroundings, nothing seemed out of the ordinary, and they began to doubt the tales. However, as they passed the church again, they were startled to find what seemed like a shadow crouching on the steps. The strange figure beckoned them with its eerie hands, inviting them to follow. Attempting to confront the ghost, they aimed their weapons, but it vanished every time they looked directly at it. Fear gripped them, their hair stood on end, and their bodies were drenched in sweat. The ghost seemed to taunt them, appearing on the church roof, its arms outstretched in a chilling gesture. Overwhelmed and frightened, they decided to retreat from the haunted place, no longer doubting the existence of the apparition. Their harrowing encounter spread like wildfire, and many ridiculed them, dismissing the ghost as a mere figment of their imagination. But the four young men stood firm, adamant that they had seen and felt the ghost's eerie presence. 
Since that fateful night, the bravest and most reckless among the villagers kept a vigilant watch, determined to solve the mystery of the ghost. Despite the scoffs and laughter from some, the four witnesses remained steadfast in their claim, convinced that they had encountered something otherworldly that defied explanation. The little white church on the prairie became a beacon of curiosity and trepidation, attracting both the daring and the doubtful. The mystery of the playful ghost continued to linger in the hearts of the villagers, leaving them to wonder what lay beyond the realm of their understanding and experience. And so, the neighborhood remained wrapped in tension and anticipation, with each night bringing a fresh wave of brave souls, hoping to unlock the secrets of the enigmatic spirit that called the church its home. In my senior year of high school, a small group of like six of us decided to go camping one night, but none of us told our parents or anyone else what we were doing or where we were going. We ended up going to this campground, but all the sites were taken so we drove really far out, to the point where we no longer saw campsites and we reached the end of the road. We found a small clearing that would fit our two cars and huge tent. It was already pitch black when we got there, so we couldn't see anything and set up a fire. We cooked some food, sat up telling stories, and eventually set up the big eight-person tent to sleep. We had heard a pack of coyotes, and I swear I heard a panther, though my group didn't hear it, so I was already pretty spooked, not to mention my crippling anxiety, but managed to fall asleep, feeling somewhat safe with the six of us in the tent. Now I'm an extremely light sleeper and wake up to even the slightest sound. Every crunch and rustle woke me up, but what woke me around one in the morning really scared the shit out of me. Something was sniffing at my head from the outside of the tent. I immediately started crying and woke up my friend next to me when the sniffing stopped, telling her what had happened. She tried brushing it off until it had sniffed us again, this time closer to her head whatever was began circling our tent then. I legitimately thought I was doing to die that night. We woke up everyone else and there we were, huddled together scared shirtless waiting for whatever it was to go away. Eventually after circling our tent many times and continued sniffing it left. It was the worst sleep I've ever gotten. When we woke up that morning we left right away but not before seeing the big sign that said bear sanctuary in our small clearing. It could have been a dog, but it kept circling our tent and sounded big and along with the bear sanctuary and supposed panther hearing, I doubt it was just a dog. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.